Okay. <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. This is day five, last day of the week, not the least. And uh, this morning, uh, <coughs> Professor Fekete is going to lecture on what some of us have heard before, but always good to hear again, to make it clear in our minds, what he means by unadulterated gold standard. What about the announcement? Yes. Oh. yes. <coughs> and um, before that starts, the professors asked me to inform you that um, with the new Austrian School of Economics, there is a series of courses going on. There's four courses. And at the end of the four courses, you, if you submit uh, a paper, and depending on the extent of the paper, you get a degree. Uh, but <coughs> the professor is prepared to count attendance at this symposium and last year's symposium to combine as one course because uh, the courses consist of 10 days or 20 lectures. And, and, and the professor is also um, willing to count attendance in Canberra, for those of you who came to Canberra. There were, again, five-day mm -hmm. symposiums or seminars of lectures. And Canberra and Oakland can be combined. Canberra and Oakland can be combined. So. Over to you, Professor, to explain in more detail the, um, the new Austrian School of Economics. Um. Thank you, um, Louis. Um, I think we can uh, <coughs> announce this officially now that Munich number two is going to be, be on. Yeah. That's. Uh, late March, early April. It's another of those 10-day, 20-lecture uh, courses, so twice as long as this one was. And uh, for the first time, we are going to <coughs> give out diplomas or degrees. <coughs> In order to get a diploma, you have to apply. It's not automatic. You have to apply. <coughs> well, uh, on, on my website, we'll make the announcement, but i tell you what it is now. During the month of January 2012, you apply, and uh, by the end of February, 2012, you submit uh, uh, something. Doesn't have to be very ambitious or substantial, but something which will reflect that you got <coughs> some value at least out of these courses. If it's not original, no problem. Uh, uh, we are offering a bachelor's degree, which would be something at that level. Somebody who would uh, write down uh, what this sequence of courses, four courses all together, met. Now you can count the Munich, which you are currently attending. That's, that's possible. Okay, so if you have three already, then you have a good chance. If you come to Munich, then you can get, get that uh, degree. For more ambitious uh, participants, <coughs> we are offering also a master degree and a PhD degree. <coughs> The PhD degree definitely <coughs> requires something original, <coughs> something which adds to the existing knowledge. Uh, the uh, master's degree 
need not be original, but it would have to be a substantial summary or survey or something which is known, put in a new light, something like that. I would <coughs> give as much leeway <coughs> to the applicants as possible. I don't want to box them in into patterns. You probably have a good idea what uh, will be acceptable and uh, meet that target. <coughs> <clears throat> so please uh, keep in mind that you have to apply, it's not automatic. You have to apply and then uh, you'll hear from us, Judith will do the correspondence, my wife, and uh, we'll let you know uh, the further details. And, uh, yes? Uh, I have a question on this. If we apply, do we choose which level we want to reach, or do we just apply and then you guys judge our stuff? And I would say yes, you choose, but there's no guarantee that you... <laughs> uh, it could be that you apply at the uh, master's level and uh, end up with a diploma at the, you know, uh, also, this is going to continue, so don't think that if you miss uh, <coughs> Munich in uh, uh, the uh, spring, then you've missed the chance. You didn't because uh, we are planning on a Munich 3, it would be August next year, and uh, don't want to go Oh, too far in the future, but hopefully we could keep this pattern two meetings a year. This group of German uh, students very enthusiastic and very enterprising, and I can only give them high praise for that. And I tell you right away that without them and without their um, uh, initiative, this wouldn't have happened. And I'm very glad it did happen, but. Uh, we tried with my wife Judith, and we just found that we, it's too much for us. I mean, uh, I, I know I, uh, I can lecture for a whole week or two weeks, but when it comes to organization, my energy runs out like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just as well that I concentrate on what I can do best and, and writing as well you know I, I uh, enjoy writing and so on and uh, uh, but uh, my energies I think are better spent if I do writing and lecturing so these uh, two young uh, German students you some of you will know them Karl <coughs> Ludwig Karl and uh, the other fellow is Bill. Bill Henn. Yeah. So uh, they uh, have my high praise for what they are doing, and they are doing it uh, not just with enthusiasm, but also with amazing <laughs> entrepreneurial skill. So uh, if possible, please do come along. We'll make uh, timely announcements what the subject will be. And uh, we always add something which is new and interesting. So uh, on that same subject, we might have had an earlier uh, course. And uh, a lot of things are happening in the world today which affect money, credit, debt, gold, silver, etc basis, co-basis, and we are still the only one in the world, right, where you can get that information. I'm not saying that the information doesn't exist elsewhere, but they won't tell you about it, and they, I have indication that they don't like what, I, what we are doing here in uh, spelling out. Uh, I mean, what we do is we do the research and then check it and check it again and when we think it's 
ready, then we make the announcement, and uh, then after that it's in the public domain. Uh, but I'm sure <coughs> other groups are doing that too, but they are not publishing their results, which I deplore. It would be nice to have a, a give and take uh, discourse with other groups who are uh, interested in the same child subject, but the, uh, no response to our initiative. That's the way it is. What can you do? All right. So, oh yes, and I mentioned uh, Canberra, which uh, the, uh, the two meetings in Canberra were five-day events like this one. So you can combine Canberra with Oakland, or two Oakland meetings, and two Canberra meetings, and then the Munich meetings, and of course in Budapest we had one, and that, if you were there, that can be counted also. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, please do, I would encourage uh, you to do, uh, to apply, and uh, uh, it's a learning experience. I will uh, appreciate the, your uh, participation because it's a feedback for me. I <coughs> learn uh, uh, from it a great deal what uh, was well understood, what was, what was perhaps not so well understood. Uh, we could improve things in the future. Any question concerning the uh, uh, degree or diploma. You understand mm -hmm. we have no accreditation, we are not seeking accreditation. Mm -hmm. So we operate on the same principle as Frank Lloyd Wright, the great American architect who never earned a degree in architecture, but he established a school and he refused to uh, apply for accreditation. He said, who are these guys? who can uh, pass a judgment on my students. That's what he in effect said, the guy sitting on the accreditation board. So, uh, <laughs> well, of course, he was, an, you might even say, a conceited man, but uh, he had the talent to back it up. So I'm not trying to put myself on the same level, but the policy is the same. I looked around, and uh, there was something in Hungary like adult education, and they had an accreditation board. But then I looked at the uh, people who represented economics, and I said, no, no, that's, uh, they, they, I, I cannot set them up as judge. They, they wouldn't even know what they're talking about. And they had this uh, idea of uh, that we are encroaching of uh, their, their turf, it's their turf. So, no, I'm not even uh, <coughs> trying to uh, pursue that line. Yes? With all due respect, Professor, you are the Frank Lloyd Wright of economics. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> I would just like to add to that, Professor, that uh, it would be a great honor to submit and to receive anything from you, but were it to be a government accredited degree or whatever, I wouldn't even apply. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have been called the uh, Einstein of money, and it was here in Auckland. Yes. Was it last year or two years ago? Anyhow, uh, on, a, on one of the TV stations. Radio uh, stations. Oh, radio stations. And uh, I, uh, I, right, I, I was right, embarrassed. It was TV, it was. You were correct. TV3, it was. TV, sorry. Yep. Okay. Uh, I was embarrassed by that, I, you know. But I, uh, I appreciate Keith uh, when he says that uh, I'm the Frank Lloyd writer. <laughs> so, uh, all right, no questions? Uh, well, of course, you can ask questions later as well. But uh, I'll make sure as soon as I return to... Hungary, that there will be a new announcement on my website about the uh, deadlines and various conditions. 
All right. <clears throat> so with this delay, <laughs> half an hour lost, but uh, um, uh, I'm uh, going to point out that not everything is really unfamiliar in my topic, which is the unadulterated gold standard. Um, uh, you see, we uh, on lecture in lecture one I, we talked about. Uh, imposters, gold standard, which were pretending to be gold standards, and they were not, because some basic element was missing. This is a little different. Unadulterated uh, starts out as uh, fully fledged, and then they deviate afterwards. And uh, why I call this adulterated gold standard is because it's a kind of gray area because it could be also illegal if you take a stricter view of the law. Let me start with the uh, most important uh, example of adulteration. And I have two names, perhaps you would care to write them down, two names for this type of adulteration of the gold standard. One is called illicit interest arbitrage. And the other <clears throat> is borrowing short and landing long illicit interest arbitrage and borrowing short and lending long. So let me talk about the second one first where uh, I would say it's a gray area because I can see <clears throat> that this practice could easily be uh, outlawed. I mean if you are a bank and you are in business of lending money. <clears throat> Can you do it by borrowing short and then turn around and at a higher rate of interest lend it out to borrowers? Or would this be something that uh, exhausts the notion of fraud? It's fraudulent, in a way, to borrow short for a bank and lend long. Because the bank, in a way, it's a Ponzi scheme. You all know the name of Charles Ponzi, uh, an Italian-American who in the 1920s had his uh, <laughs> scheme, I don't uh, repeat what it was, but it had found imitators, any number of them, some of them as in as high a place as uh, the US government, because the uh, social security system is just another Ponzi scheme. So you see, that's why I say it's a gray area, because there will be lawyers who will argue that's perfectly legitimate, and then there will be others who say, no, that's fraud, because there is no way you borrow short and then let, say you borrow one month and you lend three months. So you have to repay your borrowing in one month's time, but you won't get your money back, which you lent at three months by that. So you have to hope for either a miracle or good luck or something uh, to be able to uh, satisfy the demands of your contract. And uh, if too many people do that for the profit, which it will bring, obviously, because you lend money at a higher rate, I asked Rudy to uh, draw the so-called yield curve, which gives you an idea at what rate of interest you can expect 
for various terms. So the horizontal axis is the time, or the time to maturity. And the vertical axis is the rate. So you see that as you increase the maturity, the rate of interest is going up. And that's perfectly logical, isn't it? And this is, again, something which always applies. It's not that, oh, in good weather it's this, in bad weather it's something else again. No, because the opportunity for something to go wrong is going to be greater. The chances of some, something untoward to happen will be greater if you run the scheme for a long, longer period of time. Uh, how is Murphy's Law? Could somebody uh, recall Murphy's Law? Or can you go wrong, will go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and if you run the scheme for longer, then it's even more certain that it will go wrong. Whereas, I mean, Murphy's Law is not a theoretical law, it's an experimental law. And I would even say that for the very, very short term, Murphy's law is false. Because if uh, you run your scheme for five minutes and it would take a, a hailstorm or an electric storm or something to go wrong, then uh, we know that it won't happen. So. Uh, but if the time involved is long enough, then Murphy's law is a statistical law, and it is, it is true. So uh, we all agree that the normal yield curve is of that shape. It's an increasing curve, but it's not increasing beyond any, any height. And there is an uh, asymptotic limit to it, which is a horizontal line. And this is not theoretical. I call it asymptotic because that deviation gets smaller and smaller. Never zero, but gets smaller and smaller. And uh, this is not theoretical because there were uh, perpetual bonds, I would say, uh, before World War I. In Britain they called them consuls. And in the United States they never caught on, but there were some other countries and they called them uh, perpetual bonds. Never mature, but they paid interest. And uh, the interest was this red line here. It was higher than any other maturity, and the difference could be an arbitrarily small, depending on the maturity of the bond. So this was the, uh, what, they, what came to be known as the normal yield curve. And the word normal sub, su suggests that there is also abnormal. And this is the proof that uh, borrowing short and lending long does indeed create problems, and it should probably be uh, outlawed. Why? Because as a lot of people violate this, which means that they are they are uh, buying the short maturity and selling the long maturity. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Then that's borrowing <coughs> short and lending long, right? But if more and more and more people are doing that, 
then this is going to flatten the yield curve. which uh, is perhaps not a problem. But the problem is the overshooting. If even more of the banks are doing that, then the yield curve becomes completely unstable, and then it shoots up for the short maturity, and then it starts falling for the long maturity, as, as uh, Rudy indicated it here. And this is something which cannot work for any extended period of time. Why? Because it suggests that if you invest long term, your return is going to be lower. But if you invest short term, you are better rewarded. Now, that's against logic and against natural law. So this is something uh, that has to be avoided. And that's why I say that there ought to be a law, but there is no law. And even Austrian economists sometimes say, well, how can you limit what a bank does and the bank doesn't? Let them do and if, uh, what they want, and then if they did the wrong thing, they'll be punished. They'll go bankrupt. Now, no, I, I don't like that argument at all, because by the same logic you could, you could say, let the banks embezzle the depositors' money. If they are caught, They'll be punished. If they are not caught, well, they did the right thing. They increased their profit in the bottom line. You know, I mean, you have to draw a line. They, and, they might have passed that law because it's happening all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, there it is. I, uh, I'm not a legal expert, far from it. So I am not speaking authoritatively on this, but I would say there ought to be a law. In other words, the, uh, it's a gray area, but I am inclined to say that this should, uh, this should be uh, regulated by law. And if a bank does it, regardless whether it the punishment is immediate or the punishment is extended for a decade or so, it doesn't matter. The law had been violated, and there should be a penalty. Uh, that's my present condition, uh, condition uh, present position, and I don't think I will change on that. Uh, in my presentation, I talked a little bit about this, um, that this whole thing is possible because people's property rights have been invaded. In other words, when I deposit my bank in, uh, my money in the bank, it's not my money, it's the bank's money. That's right. And Very few it. people know that. That's right. And if this is, in the 1600s, there was a British law passed to enable this to happen. So it's actually a, a law in mm -hmm. Europe as well, I understand, that some of the people were talking about it, that specifically money, when it's put into the bank, the property rights do not go along with it. So you, you get rid of that law, and you're probably okay already, because then people decide what they want to do with their money. Uh, what do you need another law? I'm reminded of something which I, uh, I find so funny, but that I uh, have to relate it to you. I, I'll tell you this. Uh, uh, an extreme case of what Rudy is talking about is this. Each branch of, a, of the bank has a a bell. And if the bell rings, it means that all the teller's windows have to be closed and all the transactions are frozen at that level, at that moment. You see? At that moment. Because there is something, uh, such as they discovered uh, a Madoff manipulation or something. Yeah. Leave it to your imagination. But there is a, ba a bell. There is a bell. 
you don't see it, but when it rings, you will be sure to hear it, you see. Now, you go to the teller and give her a bunch of banknotes like that. And she takes it. And the bell rings. Whose is that money? <laughs> well, it's yours. It, no, no, it's the bank's. But they haven't received it. Because it already was in her hand, the teller's hand. And the window is shut. So you'll never get credit for this. The, it, you meant it as a deposit or payment for something. But kiss goodbye. Perfect.